fabulous listeners. Thanks for tuning in to Old Bodies Outside. This is your host, Dr. Brian Peterson. This episode's guest is Dr. Shana Lev Levy, who is a professor at Durham University in England. Her research applies approaches from anthropology and psychology to research hunter, gatherer societies, and social learning. Specifically, she studies how and from whom children learn through meaningful participation in everyday activities. I first came across Dr. Lev Levy's research while reading the book, The Wilderness Idiot, written by Ted Alvarez, who was featured on episode 53. This prompted me to look up her research, which then led me to inviting her onto All Bodies Outside. Dr. Lev Levy, it's an honor to have you on All Bodies Outside. Thanks so much for having me. I'm really psyched to be here. Yeah, yeah. Well, thanks for connecting from England. That's always great to have international guests on here. Yeah. Well, why don't we jump in and kind of hear about your research? So I mentioned your research in the introduction, but there's always so much more to to research. And I just kind of gave a broad overview there. So want, to start off, why don't we kind of hear more expansively what type of research you do? Yeah, so my research is kind of grounded between cultural anthropology, developmental psychology, and cultural evolution. So I'll touch on each of those first. So um, in terms of uh, cultural evolution, this idea really is that humans, our main adaptation is our culture, not necessarily our biology, though there are biological adaptations, but primarily we um, adapt through culture and through culture that we learn. So through this viewpoint, childhood is really a period of time during which you spend a lot of time investing in learning the things you need to know to be well adapted to your social and ecological environment. And then from more of a developmental perspective, I'm very interested in um, how kids learn and kind of cognitive growth, um, especially thinking about how this happens in different settings, because when we think of the things we think of as normal um, or standard, like when you read, for example, um, suggestions of when kids should be able to walk or when they should crawl or when they should speak, all of those are benchmarks that for the most part are done in children from a very small sliver of the world's population. So kids for, who are from the post-industrialized West, places like Europe, uh, places like North America. And actually, when you look at the huge diversity of childhood experiences around the world, there's a lot more variation than that. So that's the kind of second angle of my research. And then the last one is thinking about culture um, as a lived experience. So how are kids participating in culture? How are they making their own cultures? And how are they affecting adult cultures too? And so from these three perspectives, my research is really focused on how kids learn um, and um, specifically how they learn in hunter-gatherer societies. And hunter-gatherers are really interesting because these are communities that tend to be mobile they tend to rely mostly on, on non-domesticated products. Those are, there's a lot of variation in that. Um, but I think what's almost more interesting is that they also tend to practice egalitarianism. Um, they share a lot, not only food, but goods and knowledge with each other. And there's a high emphasis on individual autonomy. So kids are granted a lot of autonomy to do what they want to do, very close to what we would think about as like self-directed education. So that is kind of the perfect laboratory for trying to understand how kids learn and grow in these settings that are really complex and really different from our own. Yeah, that, you know, I'd never have thought about culture like that and, you know, culture yeah. evolution, adapting your culture. So that was really interesting for me to hear. Yeah, I mean, what's really interesting about cultural evolution is we think that the way that genes evolve, right, there are patterns in which cultures similarly evolve. So you have transmission, right, um, from parents to children. You would have that for genes, but you also have that for knowledge. But then there are other types, other factors within cultural evolution that don't map on to the kind of metaphor of genetic evolution. So if we think of like horizontal transmission, so what you learn from peers, that would be closer to like how a virus spreads from one person to another. You can also have knowledge like planking, right? Like where all of a sudden everybody's planking and then it disappears. Like that's like more of a viral spread between folks of more or less the same age group. And so by using these mathematical concepts, we can model how we expect cultures to change. And that also means that there can be a lot of applications to the type of research that we do. 
So this, this is where you're kind of synthesizing the anthropology and the psychology. Yeah, so cultural evolution has deep roots in um, anthropology, but also in psychology, thinking more about the evolution of our minds and our flexibility. So uh, humans are really generalist learners. We're really good at learning from all kinds of people and from all kinds of things, and we learn very, very quickly. And I think what's really interesting and, um, and unique about humans is we're very good at learning through perspective taking. So if you think of an infant, if you look if we can look at each other, I could look at something and you could look at me, but we could also, if you see me looking at something, you follow my gaze and also look. And through doing that, you're learning something, that type of perspective taking doesn't seem to happen. And um, in our closest related um, kin, like um, chimpanzees and gorillas and uh, bonomos, um, so um, this type of cultural learning where we have what's called theory of mind, where we, okay, if that person's looking at something, that means that's something worth looking at, um, is a really unique form of learning in humans and leads to the ability of acquiring information really, really accurately, really, really quickly, which is really important if you think of how many complex things there are to learn, right? So in the community where I work, um, Folks participate a lot in spear hunting. So these are Bayaka foragers in the Republic of the Congo. It's one of the, uh, probably one of the last populations on earth that still regularly hunt with spears for subsistence. Um, and um, we did a study on how kids learn to, how adolescent boys learn to spear hunt in that community with my colleague, Anamika Milks, who's an archeologist. And what we found in that research is that there's really complex forms of, forms of teaching that are happening for these really complex skill sets. Because if you think of what you need to know to hunt with a spear, like it's really not a simple technology. You have to know how to manufacture a tool. You have to know how to track animals. You have to know weather patterns and other hazards, right? And all of these things are constantly shifting seasonally, but also like from a moment's notice. Um, you have to be physically strong and know how to use your body, which is a different type of cognition. You have to be able to communicate and coordinate with other people in your hunting party. You have to be able to find your way home, right? And those are just like some of the things. So to be able to do, and you have to, uh, and you, then you have to be able to like, you know, fulfill the whole thing, like throw it, pin it down, do all those things that we won't talk about, um, for the vegetarians in this room without a trigger warning. Um, and all of that requires really complex skill sets, a lifetime of learning. And so you have really complex teaching that's involved in learning those skills. And those are types of teaching that we don't see in other animals, things like direct instruction, things like demonstration. So that me as a teacher would know what you don't know and then demonstrate how to do something so that you acquire information require and then that you would know that I'm doing that and then you would imit it's once you start like drilling down there's so much complexity in the types right. of learning that we take for granted which is just because we're doing it all the time and we're wired for it oh Shana that is so fascinating and like the 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 level of learning that is needed to make all those nano and micro adaptations to be able to successfully yeah. hunt and gather. Gosh, there's a lot to that. I never thought about that. That's yeah, super fascinating. Really, so it's really complex. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, and so you mentioned you do research in the Congo basin. Um, and mm -hmm. so how often do you go out there to collect data? Yeah. So when I was a PhD student, I was out there a lot. I spent a total of, I think, 14 months over four years. So not back to back, but I would go back and forth a lot. Um, in 2020, the pandemic hit and I also had a kid. So that kind of slowed things down for a while, but I'm going back for the first time in just a couple of weeks. So it'll have been almost four years since I've been there. And I'm really excited to catch up they feel like my kids, like they've taught me the language, you know, like kids who are three or four or five, who are the only people who had the time to spend hours and hours talking with me. And some of them are quite a bit older now. So I'm really excited to catch up with them and see what they've been up to, see what they've learned. Um, and I've even heard that some of my teenagers that I worked with are now married. So I'm really excited to get to know their families and see if they've had babies. So yeah, I'm really looking to heading back into the field this summer. Oh, that's fantastic. So how do you how did you make contact with uh, this culture, this society in the Congo Basin? And how did you gain access in a way that, you know, is comfortable for them? Yeah. So, you know, we are a, quite a large group of researchers now. Um, 
we, we don't all collaborate, but there's a real atmosphere of mutual support. And so there's a daisy chain of one researcher who's been there, um, is reached out to by somebody help by somebody else. And then you support them in the process of, you know, going through all the paperwork and finding research assistants and traveling up north and getting all the right gear. So I've been really lucky to work with many colleagues who've supported that process. Um, in terms of entering the community, it's like many, many layers of building trust. So first, um, when you arrive at the Capitol, you need a research permit. So you have to submit your project for review and make sure that you're not planning to do anything unethical in the community. And then you head up north um, and uh, you actually have to get to the community. And then it usually starts with a village meeting. Um, I work in a multi-ethnic village. So there's farmers and foragers who live together in the village. So I show up, there's a meeting that's held. I describe um, what I'm planning to do and I get feedback from the community and they get to ask me questions. And they decide collectively whether um, they'll let me work there. And then if they say yes, and luckily they've so far, they've said yes each time, um, then I'll go through the process of individual consent. So I'll um, interact with individuals that I want to work with and I'll tell them more about my research. I'll tell them, you know, what I'm, what they're going to get from my research, what I would expect of them in terms of the measures that I'm hoping to collect. Um, and then they agree or disagree. A lot of times people are busy, so they might want to participate, but they're, you know, about to go on a multi-week hunting trip. Um, so there's a lot of discussion. Um, and then there's an extra layer of complication if I'm working outside of the village and in a forest camp. In that case, you need to be invited into the forest camp. And then you need to present your research again to the group and they consent as a group. And then you do individual consent again. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of layers, but what's really fun about it is you get a lot of feedback about what people think about your research um, based off of the questions that they ask. So it's almost impossible not to do it collaboratively. And I think as I kind of develop as a researcher, more and more of my questions are really sourced from the community in terms of what they've asked me, um, questions they've asked me about what life is like, you know, where we're from, um, and more of these mutual exchanges. Yeah. Wow. They sound very accommodating and just respectful of your research process. I mean, I think uh, we've been really lucky in that the village where we work has not had a lot of bad experiences that we know of um, with researchers. And so because there have been net positive experiences, folks have also um, been very open. That's not always the case. Unfortunately, there can be a lot of extractive research practices or research practices that actually harm communities in what's known as ethics dumping. So there's some researchers not many that I know, um, will often go to um, lower and middle income countries to do research that would be unethical to do in their home countries. And those types of practices can lead to a lot of mistrust. But for us, because the communities we work with are quite remote, and because, you know, we have really tried um, to enact a lot of um, the work in evolutionary anthropology and developmental psychology about um, inclusion in research and consultation. So far, um, we've done okay. That could always change, right? Um, but I, for our team, I would say we hope to learn from our mistakes and take that feedback on if, if and when it comes. Wow, amazing, amazing. So when, when you're in the Congo Basin, um, I'm gonna take a little bit of a tangent here, but what types of wildlife have you seen? Yeah, oh God. Uh, so I have definitely heard chimpanzees. Um, which is really cool. Like once I, we just heard this kind of flustering um, in, up high in the trees. And then I asked my friend, what is it? And he it was right at the beginning of my field season. He spoke a bit of French and I didn't speak any Yaka. He said a word in Yaka, Sumbu. And I said, I don't know what that is. And he said in French, it's the wife of the gorilla. And then of course, you know, yeah, it's a chimpanzee. That makes a lot of sense. <laughs> you know, smaller version of a gorilla, the wife of the gorilla. That works. Um, I've seen pangolins. Um, I've seen a chameleon. Uh, gosh, trying loads of different antelopes. Um, all kinds of eels and other fish. Uh, game birds and loads of songbirds that the kids tra collect. Um, I've seen really dangerous snakes also. And luckily, you know, we've always been kept safe because even the youngest kids are able to identify those from very early on owls yeah those are just some wow. of the things yeah and in, in terms of data collection is there a season of the year that is 
uh, better suited for this hunter gatherer society for you to be there doing data collection versus maybe another se a different season? Yeah, that's a great question. So we do time our research based off of the needs of the research questions. So if we're hoping to have a very big sample for more of an experimental study where the context matters less, we'll aim to go in kind of June, July, August um, when there's a critical mass of people in the village. If we're hoping to collect data on folks who are out in camps foraging, then in that case, July and August, um, or even August through September when um, it's caterpillar and bale fishing season, or um, all the way through to uh, December or January when folks are out at their um, kind of dam fishing, they build these uh, weir fishing. So they build these giant weirs in the forest and it's a great source of fish. So we will time our research based off of um, the questions we're trying to answer in that instance. Yeah. Yeah. And so what's the, what's the weather like? So you're out there primarily, it seems like, well, it seemed like, you know, kind of summer and a little bit of winter there. What, yeah, it's what's not the summer weather? and winter there though. <laughs> Because it's oh, right, a different right. hemisphere, yeah. Or we're rather yeah. it's right at the equator, yeah. Um, okay. Yeah, I got that feedback once. I said something like, "We were there in summer," and they were like, "It's not summer when you're there." And I was like, "Oh, you're right. That was so silly of me." Um, yeah, <laughs> well, so silly me too. Yeah, <laughs> I get to pass on the wisdom that other people have passed on. Yeah, um, we've been there in the dry season and the rainy season. Um, in the rainy season, sometimes to get into a forest camp, you're walking in water, you know, up to your arm pits um we've swum across with all our gear um so um we have a lot of waterproof um packaging for all of our stuff but yeah we go there in in all seasons yeah how do you get your gear in there yeah we pack it out from um from you know wherever we're flying from so we usually come with two big containers and then we have big blue barrels you know the bear barrels with the kind of uh, metal strap and the black cap. So we pack a lot of our stuff in there because those float and they're waterproof too. Yeah. Nice. Nice. Okay. So this is all really helping me understand the context of your research. And so, um, I wanted to, let's, let's jump in a little bit more into your research and I want to know what have you learned about social learning? Yeah. Yeah. So I've learned a lot. Um, so uh, one of the main things that I've learned is that adults don't matter that much to kids learning in these communities. So adult, it's not to say adults don't matter. Um, adults are a very important source of information for things like uh, sharing norms, right? Um, for other norms of behavior. But my focus has primarily been so far on how kids learn to hunt and gather. And what I found is that kids spend most of their time hunting and gathering with other kids in what we call the multi-age um, mixed gender play group, which is seems to be a common feature across hunter gatherer societies. So kids spend a lot of time, like the group can consist of like three, to, three year olds to 18 year olds, right? And everybody in between. And that's because the camps are really small. So there's not a lot of other kids to assort by age. And it leads to some really interesting things like hunter gatherer kids tend not to play competitive games. Um, because if you think of a soccer game where you're trying to split up teams of five on five, where each team is made up of three to 18 year olds. That's not so much fun. So yeah. they tend to play very cooperative games or they tend to uh, do things like participate in pretense play. So pretending to hunt and gather is a big um, theme for kids when they're in camp. And they also go out and hunt and gather themselves. And those are really fun adventures that kids go on, not only for sustenance, right? Cause you get to have a fresh snack while your parents are out getting the big stuff. Um, but also for learning from other kids. So kids are constantly telling each other how to do things, how to climb. They're solving problems together. They're also keeping track of their ecologies. So because kids don't have a lot of constraints on their time, they can visit forest patches that may be off the beaten track. And in doing so, they discover resources that adults might never come across. So I've seen loads of instances of kids just weaving back and forth. I'm like on my hands and knees with my interpreter under bushes. And it's like the right size for the kids, you know, and I'm like belly crawling along. And as they're doing that, they come across a patch of something like a palm nut that happens to be ripe. They'll go back to camp once they're done playing, tell their parent, hey, we found these ripe palm nuts. And then the next day, the adults just 
cut a straight path exactly to the resource and then they get loads of food. So there's a really symbiotic relationship between what the kids are up to and what the adults are up to. And the kids are really supporting their communities through their play activities. And I think we tend to think of play, I mean, not always, but we tend to think of it as like preparation for something. Either it doesn't have a purpose, right? And it's kids goofing off or it's them developing a skill set, right? But actually in these hunter-gatherer communities, the play is really foundational to the culture there. So by playing, um, kids are discovering things and that has immediate benefits to the community. Gosh, and it all I like the word that you used earlier, this kind of cooperative community where there's just a lot of things interacting to overall just boost the success of the community with hunting and yeah. gathering. And that's really cool. Yeah. Even from, so you know, kids all the way. Yeah. No. So what's interesting about that is... Um, so yes, there's a lot of cooperation, but hunter gatherers tend to practice something we call uh, cooperative autonomy. So there's a lot of cooperation, but there's a lot of emphasis on individual autonomy. And so what this looks like is that everybody goes out and does their own thing. At the end of the day, you come back together, you share everything you've collected, and there are really strong taboos against coercing other people. And in one study we did, we found that the only instance in which parents told other parents what to do was when the parents being told off were telling, trying to tell their children to do something they didn't want to do. So there are strong norms against trying to coerce other behaviors, even if that's a child that you're talking to. So there's really a uh, strong point of view that kids have their own learning to do, their own kind of tracks to follow, and that if you interfere with that, you actually get in the way of their development. And um, But at the other side of that, there are really, really strong norms for cooperation. And so people kind of channel their autonomy into those cooperative norms. So there's this real give and take between autonomy and cooperation. And sometimes it falls apart, right? Sometimes there's too much tension and somebody's unhappy and they decide to leave the camp or family split apart if they feel that one group is trying to enforce too much cooperation or on the other hand, another group isn't sharing. So that does fall apart. But on the whole, there seems to be this balance and it leads to these really interesting social interactions of folks, you know, waking up in the morning, going and collecting their own food. And then in the evening, there's this buzz of folks cooking and sending plates from one house to another. And that's something that loads of people talk about in different hunter-gatherer communities of kids running from one house to another with plates, sharing food. So you'll have a giant pot of food. I think in one study, they estimated that up to 80% of the food is shared. Um, and that's all kids running plates from one house to another. So it's a really interesting scene in the evening. It's not, not necessarily restful. People are very busy, like getting their sharing done before they can rest. Yeah, the, uh, what a fascinating concept too between this what almost feels like a, a dichotomy, you know, cooperative and autonomy, yeah. and it, they bring it together so well. That's so fascinating. Yeah, it's definitely um, inspirational. I think in terms of not that we should try and be like hunter gatherers, but it gives a model of how you know. It, I feel like in like current politics, we're like, is it cooperation or is it autonomy? What matters? And there's actually like a place in which these two things can go and just can coexist pretty seamlessly. Yeah. So earlier you mentioned that, you know, if there's a disagreement in the level of cooperation or the level of autonomy, some people will leave camp. And what does that mean? What does that look like? Yeah. So, you know, folks have rights to hunt and gather in loads of different parts of the forest based off either places that they tend or places that they're connected to, to through um, their parents and their family or through their in-laws. So because these are mobile communities that tend to move every few months, um, there's a lot of places to go to get good food, right? So you're not really bound to a single location. Um, if either the kind of foraging patch has been depleted, right, the seasons change and there's just not enough food to go around, or if you have conflict, um, or if you just get bored and you just want to hang out with different people, you can pick up your stuff and move and not having a lot of stuff really facilitates that most of what folks have can fit into one big kind of carrying basket and you can get up and go. Yeah. Yeah. Gosh. Well, your research is, is amazing. And it sounds like in two weeks, you're going to be having a great time and reconnecting yeah. with some friends. Um, that sounds fantastic. 
But I also want to hear about how your research has impacted your life. You're a mother, you're living in England. And so how is your research with, you know, looking at this, the way that children adapt to their culture, they're also autonomous, but they're cooperative. How has this kind of changed your perspectives of yeah. maybe familyhood and motherhood? Yeah, so I think when I went into this research, I went in with a lot of romantic notions. And I think that's true for a lot of folks who go and study hunter gatherers. And what I always say is like you go in with romantic notions about how you'll be as an individual on the other side, and then you come out radicalized that about what's possible at the community level. So I think like I went in thinking like, oh, I'll come out on the other side wanting to do like hunter gatherer parenting, you know, like attachment parenting, baby wearing, co-sleeping, uh, full autonomy, never say the word no, like all of these types of things. And I've done some of those things when they're practical, but I think what it has really made me realize is that it's really hard to parent and you need a community around you. You need a community who supports you. And that's just not what it looks like in our society. And what I have found um, really nice about working with hunter gatherers is they're very practical people. So they do what works and they ditch what doesn't work. And they're very open to, to, you know, acquiring new technologies and new innovations to be able to sustain their livelihoods. Um, and so that's, I think, more of the um, attitude that I've adopted. And I think another thing too, and I'll give you a concrete example of what that looks like in a sec. Um, and I think another thing too, is that like I, as a parent, I'm, I'm part of this relationship. I think when we think of child focus, we tend to overemphasize the child and the adults should kind of suppress all their needs and wants and desires and aspirations and only meet the needs of the child. But sometimes I think in some cases that could lead to some self-centeredness. And so I, coming out of these experiences, have been like, no, I'm actually, I'm part of this parent-child relationship. And sometimes I have needs that matter. Um, and we have to negotiate ways that work for both of us. So um, our kid is two, almost three actually. And just, yeah, in almost a month, um, he'll be three. And he still sleeps in our bed. And you know what? We decided not to fight that fight. That's his choice. Um, but at the same time, he wakes up at five in the morning and I, we just hand him games on the phone and he plays for an hour before we all wake up. And that means that everybody is in a much better mood when we wake up and not grumpy and not snappy. And so by honoring all of our needs, you know, finding a middle ground that's maybe not the best parenting and if we had loads of kids and other parents around to, to you know be other caretakers that might not be the choice that i would make this path of least resistance for the nuclear family that we find ourselves in works for us at this stage um so i think there's so much shaming of parents i don't know if you have this experience too like folks are always told well, like what the right way and the wrong way to parent is and i think hunter gatherers are often viewed as the benchmark but um I would, in my experience, talking with hunter-gatherers, there's no right, they wouldn't say that there's a right way to parent. There's a normative way to parent, but there's no like morally correct way to parent. Yeah, that's a great statement there that you made at the end because there is a lot of parental shaming out there. Yeah. Um, and, and, and my situation, I, we, so I'm a stepdad and I have a, an 11 year old and a 12 year old and their biological father is fantastic. He lives about 20, 25 minutes away. We're all really close. He's a friend um, and he's enjoyable to talk to. He's very helpful, he's adaptive. Um, and so we have a situation where we have three parents giving a lot of love to the kids. That's and awesome. I gotta say though, like with the kids doing all kinds of sports now, they're, and we're just letting them explore stuff. And they're like, hey, I wanna do after school volleyball or hey, I wanna do after school track. And we're like, hey, like try some new stuff, that's awesome. But I got to say, like, you know, in terms of the nuclear family, it's almost like we need three parents to get the kids yeah. <laughs> moving around and whatnot into their different places. And so we're always running logistics between the three of us on text message. And yeah. um, it's tough being, you know, just a nuclear family. Like, you know, a lot of times having that community aspect, I can see how that could be beneficial. Absolutely. And, you know, divorce is really, really common in hunter gatherer societies, like many, many marriages end in divorce and folks often live with step parents or or even like adoptive parents or their grandparents. And 
those are relationships that are really fruitful. And like you say, it offers you more kind of hands on uh, to live in these extended households and to have places to move to cool off. Like if you have a disagreement with one parent in one household, you can go spend a couple nights in the other household. That's a place where you're cared for and that you can cool off. And then, you know, that's another element of mobility when we talk about mobility. Yes. There are families that fish in fusions, but I've seen kids like be like, I, I'm going, I'm going to go stay with my uncles. I'm like, I need a break from you parents, you know? So it does allow for this opportunity. Like you say, three is the minimum, <laughs> in my opinion. And the more hands you have on deck being supportive, the, the more successful and the more relaxed you can be in your parenting. Yeah. And then the more hands on deck too, the more observations the kids can make for their learning. Yes. Yeah. And I think that's like something that comes up a lot. So we really view in our society as like parents being like, you have to teach your child and you have to help them like develop and you have to, you have to help them read. And if they don't meet these kind of like imagined milestones that we have, then you have somehow failed as a parent. But then it's very difficult to mix this kind of teaching, right? Very active and direct teaching that's very time consuming with the kind of love and care that we also expect parents to have, right? Like that attachment, um, that safety, that safe harbor where you can just like veg out on the couch and snuggle um, and then not think about, you know, all the milestones you have to meet. And it's, I think it's almost impossible for two parents to accomplish both of those roles simultaneously. And so that's, what's really nice about Allo parents too. Like, what like an uncle can take a kid out hunting and learn you know there's a very actually special relationships between um uncles and sons and a very important relationship in terms of teaching and i think that removes some of the tension that you would have with your parent who's your safe harbor who you can kind of act out around and have that teaching relationship with somebody else but that your parents also know and trust you know what i mean yeah yeah that sounds that's very interesting that's very interesting but yeah i think like you said more hands on deck the better right and yeah. <laughs> that is interesting to hear about the the role of the uncle and how powerful that is yeah i mean we have things like that in our culture too like folks who are christian might have a godparent whose job it is to facilitate kind of religious education so you know we have those kind of relationships it's just a matter of like identifying them and recognizing them as more than just ceremonial but like people who might actually show up when you need them yeah, true, true, true. Yeah, very interesting. Well, I want to kind of shift a little bit over into hearing about uh, and, and the these communities that you have studied, their kind of daily time allocation. And how does that compare to, say, the society we live in? Yeah, so folks are moving all the time, like constantly running around. Um, the kids are very active. The adults are very active. But then they also have a lot of rest too. So when they're active, they're super active. But then when they're resting, they have a lot of time for leisure time and for hanging out with each other. So how a day usually unfolds is you wake up in the morning. Um, a kid is usually sent out if the coals in your fire have gone out. A kid is usually sent out to um, go get coals from somebody else's fire to rekindle, relight the fire. Um, and then from there, you slowly wake up, you reheat some leftovers, you might, you know, go to your neighbor's house and sit on their porch and warm up and have a conversation, talk about your dreams, um, talk about what you think you're going to do that day. After some breakfast, um, you might go out um, to hunt and gather in the forest. Um, and that can be as little as a couple hours or as much as like mul a multiple day trip. Um Kids may choose to either go with their parents or spend time with um, other kids to do their own kind of activities, either play or go out foraging on their own. Or folks may decide to stay um, in and, um, you know, fix some stuff, fix their houses or, you know, repair a tool. They might also choose to participate in wage or trade labor with neighboring farmers. So they might... Um, for example, help them with their houses in exchange for a good that they need or in exchange for payment or collect some firewood, things like that. Um, and then folks come back together in the evening. Cooking is like a really time consuming endeavor. It takes like three hours to cook dinner. So women get together um, and usually cook, um, I would say like two families to a pot more or less um, and cook a really big meal. And then the evening sharing happens. And then amongst the Bayaka, most evening, there's a lot of singing and dancing that happens. It'll change across seasons. So there's some seasons where folks participate in that more and other seasons less. But overall, folks like to party and 
there's always a reason to party. So they'll be dancing. Um, they'll be hanging out. They'll be joking. They'll be storytelling. Um, there'll be kids running around playing a game of tag or hide and seek. So it's really I one of my favorite things to do, actually. And I'm so looking forward to doing that this summer is in the evening once we've eaten um, to just sit on my on my porch of the research house that we've built and just listen to the sounds of of what's happening and it's so vibrant it's like i don't know if you've ever woken up and listened to the dawn chorus in the morning with the birds where all the birds are going off and you just it's like that that level of energy but with humans like chatting and laughing and singing and and screaming and playing and it's it's like a really nourishing kind of soundscape yeah well i've never you know so i actually i do a very small little bit of soundscape research um oh, in cool. national parks in the united states but like it's, oh, it's awesome. definitely not my expertise but you got me thinking about um societal soundscapes like that at nighttime yeah. when there's just this vibrancy that would be really interesting to study too just you know this the soundscape like that's that's fascinating yeah. and you know i have memories of this too like i i lived where, where i grew up in montreal we lived in townhouses so there was like an open area shared by all the houses where the kids would play and at the time um not all the wires were buried so we'd get power outages when there were big storms um and in the summer when there were power outages everybody would sit out on their porches because there's nothing to do inside right no tv to watch nothing and you know the kids would run around the adults would be sitting on each other's stoops um catching up and gossiping and telling ghost stories right and like i it was that same feeling of like everybody's out everybody's talking everybody's playing you can flit from one conversation to another and it's like a very or like i don't know if you if you went to summer camp maybe some of the people listening in like when I, when i was a kid at summer camp it was again this like evening of running around sitting by the fire telling stories they're really um it like i think touches something that sometimes we lack not to say that hunter gatherer societies are perfect right not having access and i think maybe i'll temper a little bit like when you don't have access to western medicine because you live in a really remote community not because you don't want it but because you don't have access to it there's a lot of child mortality um there's a lot of disability um there's a lot of folks who um like just like mourn losses of their parents or their siblings or folks who've died from honestly preventable causes only because there have no been, not been vaccination campaigns in recent times or somebody dies in childbirth and so i want to temper by saying like there's grief also it's not all like kind of unabashed joy but just that evening landscape um is like really really special um and something that that it hits me where i need it um especially when i live in this kind of single family household <laughs> with all of our family like many many hours away yeah well i mean i certainly kind of just live myself i live in a box in a way i mean i'm, I'm working from home today um and i'm probably not gonna be social at all with anyone except for my wife <laughs> and my yeah. kids are are with their biological dad tonight so right. i'm not gonna see them <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I'll be <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I remember this true. moment where like where um you know cuz in our research house we live with the door open most of the time and there just happened to be a moment where all of my research assistants were out collecting data and everybody in the village was out and I was like, "Oh, I'm just going to close the door and like have a moment to myself." And I stood there for 5 minutes. I was like, "No, it doesn't feel right." And I had to open the door cuz you get really used to living in public, right? Um and you know is then once all of a sudden you're in private you have to readjust to learning to be just kind of alone and quiet and and sitting and you know it's just a very different embodied experience and when you're there for a long period of time because you get kind of used to those interactions and that type of social movement it feels weird to try and then do the north american version <laughs> on your own in that context yeah, well, I, I liked earlier that you brought up the, the ch you know, camp and kids going to camp. And so that got me really excited because my kids are heading out to camp in about three weeks and they're going to be gone for one month uh, up in the right. northern United States. And um, awesome. in past years, we sent them for two weeks. And this year we're, we're going for the, the month long camp trip. And so uh, the kids are getting some pushback right now, but um, we're, we're kind of happy that they're going to be a little bit uncomfortable going into it. Um, yeah. because we know they're going to have a great time and they're going to have to do things with their own autonomy, but also in a cooperative environment in a way. Totally. Camp is such a good example of, you know, it's, 
very close, I find, at least based on my own experiences of how hunter-gatherer kids grow up. Number one, camp counselors are all teenagers. So you literally have kids taking care of other kids, true, right? And I was a camp counselor for years and years. You have all kinds of norms that emerge. Um, you have opportunities to take risks in a safe setting. We had, you know, an activity where we'd get woken up in the middle of the night and we had to sneak through the woods, like through dawn as like the older kids were like trying to block us and catch us things like capture the flag or like sneaking, sneaking into each other's bunks, right? Like all of these like are ways of breaking rules and taking risks totally in a safe environment with lots of people caring for you. Um, and then it's such a good example of mobility, right? Like we talk about hunter gatherers as being seasonally mobile in lots of North American families. Kids are also seasonally mobile. You might, you know, send them off with their grandparents when the parents go on vacation and you send them to summer camp for a few weeks of the month. And so they have three dwellings as opposed to just one, right? So there's all these ways in which once you start drilling down, you realize that these experiences are happening all the time. We just don't, we don't talk about them with the same language when really we should. Yeah, yeah. That, what, what a great way that you just put that. And I love that camp provides this level of exploration for kids to take, quote unquote, safe risks and, you know, to test some stuff out by themselves. Like that is such awesome growth right there or opportunities for growth. I mean. Yeah, absolutely. And they, you know, they're forced to lead all kinds of stuff and play. Yeah, I, I miss I wish I could go back to camp. <laughs> Uh, we need some, yeah, I know adult camps are out there somewhere, but I feel like we all need them uh, a lot more. <laughs> yeah, totally. <laughs> all right, Shay, so I wanted to connect um, back to the introduction. I mentioned the book, The Wilderness Idiot, written by Ted Alvarez. And uh, just to repeat myself, I had interviewed him on episode 53. You're going to be episode uh, 55. So I interviewed him two episodes ago. And this is how I came across the research. I was reading The Wilderness Idiot. Um, he mentioned it. I went and looked you up and I was like, oh gosh, Shana Lev Levy is up to such cool stuff. I do not know much about anthropology or psychology. And so I want to learn from her. But first off, I want to know, how did you and Ted connect? How did you get mentioned in this book? Yeah, so I think Ted read a book by uh, somebody who mentored me very closely called Nate Summers. And um, Nate wrote a book about um, survival skills or kind of indigenous skills or first skills. Um, and I actually, before I went to university, spent a couple years at a school uh, outside of Seattle called the Wilderness Awareness School. And so I spent a couple years like running around the forest, trying to learn to hunt and gather myself long before I'd spent any time with actual, you know, living, hunting and gathering populations. And um, through those experiences, especially with my friend, um, my very close friend, Luke, uh, who is my child's godfather and who is in charge of his wilderness education. So again, we're coming back to the fictive kinship. Um, so with my buddy Luke, we would go out for months, uh, for weeks at a time, trying to um, trying to survive with only stuff that we'd made ourselves and food that we'd wild harvested ourselves. And we did not thrive. Like we really failed. And so that led me to kind of realize three important things. So the first is it takes a lot of learning to be a hunter, a hunter gatherer. And we watched a lot of YouTube and read a lot of books and went to museums and did our research, but you have to have that kind of lived experience and, you know, that, um, culture around you. Um, second, um, that you, you have to be tending to your environment to be able to hunt and gather on a landscape. So it's not like you can show up in, you know, a logged forest and just start hunting and gathering. You have to tend the environment to produce the types of food. So thinking of like uh, wild tubers, for example, in the Pacific Northwest, those would have been taken from on the other side in the desert, camas roots from the mountains and taken in, or you would have had to tend, um, tend meadows for them to stay meadows um, so that you can um, grow camas roots or dig up the soil and then replant small camas roots so that they can grow big. So there's all kinds of tending that happens in hunter-gatherer societies um, to be able to maintain um, humans on the landscape. So where I work, for example, um, there are practices of replanting the tops of um, of tubers, and then those sprout more tubers. Um, so there's a lot of maintenance and knowledge of how to maintain food in your environment. Um, 
and then finally cooperation. So we were just two of us trying to survive and we were not very good hunter gatherers. Um, and we didn't have anybody else. And we would always fantasize. What if like down the other logging road, there was another camp of people. And if we didn't have food, we could go there. Um, and those three things I think are kind of the lessons that I've learned and that I've taken through my research um, that have really driven my research questions to ask, like, how do you learn? How do you cooperate? How do you tend to the environment in a way that increases the abundance of foods that you rely on. Um, and so it was a really formative experience. And I really recommend there's loads of uh, wilderness um, survival schools that have the same learning philosophy as Wilderness Awareness School. And it's been really formative to me. And um, I went there as a 19 year old and I left at 21 and headed to university. And and I still maintain very close friendships and visit frequently. I just had a friend visit from uh, from Washington who came here just a couple months ago. And it remains like a safe harbor for me um, and a, a point of connection too. So yeah, that's how Ted found out about me. So through Nate Summer's book. Um, and it was very nice of him to reach out to me. Gosh, Shana, uh, I don't know if you get the compliment, but you're like a triple badass person here like i didn't even know that about you and your research i mean you got like all these things here of like your research being a professor your the, the where you go for your data collection your past experiences that led to your research my gosh this is so cool yeah i should say that like i'm a real couch potato so you know for folks who might think you have to be like super fit or super like i think if you show up in these things with an open mind and a willingness to learn i mean that's all that it's taken me and i'm not very good and you know it's a joke in congo when i go like people say like you've been here for four years you should know how to identify this plant by now or you should know how to do this and i'm actually not very good at a lot of things but i like people so i try and spend time with them and learn from them where i can and that's really all it takes. <laughs> well, and it sounds like you bring a, a high level of humility to, to, you know, recognize where you need to learn things that, you know, you can't, that you're like, Hey, I don't know about that. And, you know, going about it and researching it and studying it. Yeah. I've been, like I said, I've been incredibly lucky to be mentored by loads of amazing people inside and outside of academia. And that's something I try to pay forward. Um, but having mentors help you grow and recognize your gifts and also recognize where you have some growth to do and to help you do that gently um, has I've been so lucky in that respect. And so, um, yeah, it's something I think that we need to be thinking about a lot more. You're an academic, you know, that we think of mentorship as like a lot more like publish your papers, get a postdoc, do these things, but actually the kind of emotional skill set. I've been lucky to have academic mentors who've cared about my emotional development through this process. And um, so if it's been, you know, just, I've just been incredibly lucky. There's no, there's no potion. There's just luck in reaching out to people that you think are cool and want to hang out with. Yeah. That mentorship really is, it's super important. The emotional development that goes along with the profession. It's, it's a profession that there's a lot always going on and there's, it's yeah, always it's a totally. juggle fest. Yeah. Um, and so I, I've definitely benefited from some really great mentorship as well. That's awesome. Well, Shana, it's been fantastic having you on Old Bodies Outside, and I'm glad that you joined us from outside. So I think that <laughs> fits perfectly with the podcast. So thank you for doing that. Um, hey, I just want to say thank you so much for connecting from England, talking about your research. It is extremely fascinating, and I look forward to seeing what you're up to in the future and kind of just tracking your research and seeing how it progresses. Yeah, and thank you so much for having me. It's been a real joy to talk to you. And yeah, I'm looking forward to now following all your pod all your podcast episodes. <laughs> well, I appreciate it. I appreciate it. Okay, I'm going to throw on that outro music. We're going to call an episode. <laughs>